All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is David Keck. I'm the director of the Jeffrey S. Reich School of Computer Science and Management. Uh, this week, UNL is celebrating the dedication of the Jeffrey S. Reich School, which has been named in honor of our speaker this afternoon. The school has been named for Jeff because of the enormous impact that he's had, not only on the school, but on each of the students, the graduates, and the faculty and staff. Jeff's influence began 10 years ago when he was asked to develop the initial vision and mission for the school. Jeff later became the first chairman of the school's advisory board and along with Chancellor Perlman, recruited a board that I believe would be among the best in the Fortune 500. Jeff's concept was that graduates of the school would have a balanced education in both computer science and management with a balance of scholarly and real world project experiences. The school remains unrivaled worldwide. In a video provided by Bill Gates for the school's dedication today, Bill said, the Rake School is filling a vital need in developing the next generation of business leaders. Jeff began his career working with perhaps the two greatest visionaries in the world of computing and business, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Jeff left Apple in 1981 and joined a very small Microsoft company just before their legendary deal to uh, provide operating systems for the new IBM PC. Early in his Microsoft career, Jeff drove the, the strategy and design of the Microsoft Office products and at the time of his retirement was president of the division that includes Office and other business solutions. That division now is Microsoft's largest and most profitable product division. In fact, that division alone has higher revenue than the world's second largest software company. Bill Gates also in that video said, Jeff did a lot of the work that made Microsoft the success that it is today. Jeff didn't spend much time in retirement though because in early September he began his new position as CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is dedicated to innovations in health and learning worldwide. Jeff has not only been a leader in business, but is also recognized, recognized as a leader in philanthropic endeavors through the Rakes Family Foundation, which Jeff co-chairs with his wife, Tricia. The Rakes Foundation supports youth development, education, and other community issues. And it was the Rakes Foundation that recently made a generous gift to the University of Nebraska Foundation, enabling his namesake school and its grads to achieve even higher levels of success. Jeff is a native of Ashland, Nebraska, and despite now being a resident of Washington State and a Stanford grad, Jeff is a huge Huskers fan and considers himself, first of all, to be a Nebraskan. We're all very fortunate that Jeff Rakes has remained a champion of causes that support this university and this state. And we are extremely proud to have Jeff's name on our school. Jeff's presentation today is entitled Business and Leadership Lessons. Please help me welcome Jeff Rakes. Thanks very much, and, and uh, uh, welcome to all of you. I appreciate you being here. Let's really get down to business. Husker's going to beat Virginia Tech tomorrow. Yeah. There's at least two reasons I'm here this weekend. That's one of them. <laughs> well, it's a, a great honor to be able to have the chance to speak to you uh, today. And I want to describe my comments today as a little bit like the lecture equivalent to a survey course. In other words, I'm going to cover a lot of things uh, very quickly. I'm going to cover at least 12 or 13 or 14 lessons that I took away uh, that I was fortunate to learn from my, my time in, in business. Each of these probably could be at least an hour or more discussion if we were able to sit down and, and speak. But since I'm not sure if I'll get invited back, I thought I'd better squeeze them all in today. Well, the lessons I want to share with you, I'm going to break into three pieces. I want to share with you a little bit about growing up in Nebraska and also about uh, how it relates to, to my own career. Second thing I want to do is I want to share with you some business and strategy uh, lessons on leadership. And the third thing I'd like to do is to talk to you a little bit about what sometimes th people think of as the softer side of things, uh, people leadership. And we do hope there will be some time for Q&A, and, and uh, I look forward to your, to your questions and, and comments. 
Now, in some respects for me, it begins right here. This is our, our family farm. It's about seven miles uh, outside Ashland. Uh, this is where I grew up. And the reason I like to put this picture up is because one of the most important things I think all of you should reflect on, I know I reflect on, is how my, my years growing up really shaped my values. And I'm going to focus a little bit later about how I think your values parlay into your leadership and your leadership style. But here I just want to start out by saying, for me, this is where it really all began. You know, we were very fortunate to have, uh, uh, you know, strong parents. I had great siblings. I'm the youngest of five children. And I learned a lot of values growing up on the farm uh, with my family and with the, the community in which I grew up. Certainly one of the important things I learned was, was uh, the value of work ethic. I learned to drive a tractor when I was seven years old. Uh, I started working in the fields on our farm when I was nine and pretty much worked the summers or the weekends uh, all the way until my graduation from college. But I think part of the reason why work ethic uh, is important relates to another value I learned growing up on the farm. And that's the value of passion for what you do. Now, I think in, the, in growing up on the farm, part of it is when you have that sense of responsibility for something that's living, something that's growing, whether it's the livestock you're caring for, uh, caring for, whether it's the, the crop that you're trying to keep from dying during a drought, getting out in the middle of the night to do the irrigation, those, that sense of responsibility, I know for me, really instilled a passion uh, for the work that, that I was doing. And I also think that that was very representative in my, my parents and my, my siblings. They really instilled, and I, I want to in particular credit uh, our mother. My mother just set an expectation that we were to do well. It's what I call internal competitiveness. It wasn't so much about whether I was going to beat the other guy. In her view, it was whether I was doing the best that I could possibly do. And that was one of the most important values that I think that, was, was, that she shaped in me and, and all of us. Another value that I think you get a sense of when you're, you're growing up on a small, uh, in a small community is that sense of community. You're with your neighbors. And it's very important that you develop those values of honesty and integrity. You know, most business in that context isn't done with a legal contract. It's done on a handshake. You have that responsibility to live up to the expectations, the value that your uh, neighbors would expect of you. And those are some of the things that I think are very, very important. Values of honesty and integrity and uh, that, that sense of community, along with work ethic, passion, and internal competitiveness. So as I said, I'm going to come back to values later. But I want to move on. From the farm, I went to uh, another farm, uh, Stanford. Stanford is sometimes called the farm because Leland Stanford Sr. had a big horse farm, and that's where the campus is today. Now, you might say, well, why, why did I go off to California, and, and why did I go to Stanford? Well, my father had the idea that getting a business education was more important that, for me than getting an agricultural education. So, and he read in some Business Week or US News and World Report that Stanford had perhaps the top business school in the, in the country. So I said, well, why don't you go there? And well, senior year in high school, I visited. Uh, it was over Christmas. It was about 10 below in Nebraska, and it was 70 degrees on Palm Drive. And I turned to my mother. I said, I think I want to go here. Uh, but actually, the real reason uh, I went is because I believed in what he said, that it would be a good idea for me to get a business education to show you that I wasn't necessarily the most astute when it comes to college applications uh, and that process, I didn't realize until I got to Stanford that they have no undergraduate business school. <laughs> so I went into engineering. Uh, and I attended an engineering fair my first weekend, and I met a very interesting individual. Uh, his name was, was uh, Dr. Bill Linville. He was the the head of a department called Engineering Economic Systems. And Dr. Linville and I were, uh, e it was very easy for me to connect with him because he grew up on a hog farm in Missouri. 
And so Dr. Linville kind of took me under his, his wing. And uh, we okay now? On the, got it. Sorry, got the interference going. Dr. Linville kind of took me under his wing and helped me to design a major in engineering economic systems that was intended uh, by my goal, my desire, my aspiration to prepare me to go work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and, Ag and Agricultural Policy. I had this dream that I was going to help change the world in a positive way through agricultural uh, policy. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. So for four years, I really focused in on engineering and, and uh, engineering economic systems. And, and I had that idea. And then just before I graduated from, from Stanford, I had bought an Apple II computer to help my brother run our family farm in Ashley. And gosh, I thought, this is an amazing device. This is really fun. It's, it's incredible how I can get this computer to do things that I, I, I want it to do. In particular, I had this idea that it would help my brother uh, be able to do better farm management and, and farm analysis. And so I hadn't had a lot of experience in doing job interviews, so I interviewed with this company in Silicon Valley called Apple Computer. And a few months later, I was the VisiCalc engineering manager. Now, almost everybody in this room is so young, you won't remember VisiCalc, but it was the original electronic spreadsheet. It was the forerunner, or you can think of it as the granddaddy of, of things like Microsoft Excel. So I went to Apple Computer I, in uh, 1981 uh, to, to work on VisiCalc. So, for four years, I was very focused in on the idea of going to the USDA, and then suddenly I'm doing something uh, different. And it was very fun, but I learned two important lessons at Apple Computer. Number one, I learned that I love software. People would come to me with what they considered to be the toughest electronic spreadsheet problem. And for me, it was like a puzzle. You know, and I'd stay up all night trying to figure out if I could get uh, the spreadsheet to do critical path management or a PERT chart. And then you come in the next morning and you show that to the people who wanted to see if you could do that and their eyes light up. That was the magic of software. And I got hooked. And it goes back to that value of passion. I found that passion for what I was going to do. The second most important thing I learned at Apple Computer is that if you want to do great software, you got to do it at a software company. Hardware companies tend to think of software as just a way to sell their device or their computer or their box. And at Microsoft, software was life itself. That's what we, we believed in. So in 1981, uh, so I'd been at Apple about a year and a half, I made another move. I went to this small software company in, in Seattle, uh, uh, or Bellevue, Washington, called, called Microsoft. Uh, about 100 employees, $12 million worldwide annual revenues. I didn't go to Microsoft because I thought Microsoft was going to be as big a company as it is today. In fact, back then, to be honest, we debated about whether there would ever be a $100 million software company in the personal computer business. We weren't really sure because we thought the hardware companies might just wipe out this little old software business. But we believed in what we were doing, and we were passionate about it. And so I uh, uh, ended up with a 27-year career there that just unbelievable in terms of the opportunities that I was presented. So now I want to bring this together and share with you one important lesson that I hope all of the students here really focus in on. It's very, very good and important to have a plan. But I'd say, in particular, my father taught me it was very good to be open to opportunity. And so while I had this plan that I was going to go work for the USDA, the opportunity opened up, and I jumped on it. And I couldn't be happier uh, that, that I did. And the same was really true at Microsoft in many ways. There were multiple times where you know, people would ask me, well, well how you know?" I'd like to be president of a division of Microsoft. How do you manage your career? And I never thought of it in that way, and I don't actually encourage them to think of it in that way either. The two most important things I'd share with them, I also share with you. What you should do is you should find something that you love to do and something that adds value to the company. 
1991, when Bill Gates said to me on an airplane ride, Jeff, I want you to, to go over and run our field sales organization, that to me seemed very strange. For, what, almost 10 years I'd been working on building Microsoft Office. I felt my, I was a product guy. I'm not a sales guy, Bill. I'd never been a sales manager. He said, Jeff, that's not the point. The point is you've been, you understand our strategies. You can help us build the key assets that, that we need to succeed. So I listened to him. I found a job I enjoyed within that environment. And for the next eight years, I was a, a part of our, our sales organization. Then the next, the next role uh, was the business division. So the key, the key principle on career management, it's probably good to have a plan. I never really had much of a plan. But the most important thing was I found roles or jobs that I really enjoyed doing and that were valuable to the company. And I would trust your instincts on that. If you find things like that, uh, you're, you're, you know, be open to those, those kinds of opportunities. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to switch gears and move into that second topic, which is about uh, some of the lessons that I learned on business and business strategy. This is a somewhat complex chart. I'm not going to go through all the details, but it really is meant to underscore that in the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years, there's been a huge amount of change in the world of information technology. You go back to 1980 with that M IBM PC that Dr. Keck uh, mentioned, and then you know, that was when PCs and spreadsheets were we're just coming onto the market, and then the late 80s when graphical user interface, what we take for granted today, when that started to be popular and collaboration solutions as the internet began to explode, so on and so forth. You know, Bill one time in a book shared something that I think is very important. He said, we as human beings have a tendency to overestimate changes in the near term, but underestimate changes in the long term. I see a lot of the, the students of the Rake School here probably written some code, and they know that we always tend to think we're going to get that, get that software done before we actually do. Maybe that's true of your homework assignment. So sometimes we overestimate change in the short term, but we also have a tendency to underestimate change in the long term. 1990, go back to 1990 uh, for a second. Some of the, the students were, were just being born. Back then, we talked about a car phone. And that meant that there was a phone in the car, obviously. But if I had told you then that actually in the future, there were going to be multiple people on different phones in a car, no way. It's a car phone. But the world changed. In 1987, I had a big debate with, with Bill Gates about our office business. I was doing our marketing, and I happened to really have to do a lot of overhead, uh, uh, overhead foils. I mean, these kids don't even know what an overhead is. And, and you know, I thought, Bill, you know, there's this software product I, I've learned about that does soft, it's software to do overheads. Oh, that's, you know, I think that's really cool. And Bill said, no, 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 come on, Jeff. That's just a feature of Microsoft Word. And I said, no, Bill. I, I really think this is different. I think we ought to buy this company. So I convinced Bill that we should spend $15 million to buy a company in Silicon Valley called Forethought. You know what their product was? PowerPoint. It was PowerPoint. Because I thought it would be cool to have software to do overheads. Now, it's probably been 10 years since I saw an overhead projector. And in fact, I never, when I was convincing Bill that we needed that product, I never believed that what we were going to see or was that you just walk into a, a, a room and, and your computer's plugged into the projector and you don't have to get overhead foils and you don't have to get uh, photographic slides or 35 millimeter slides. That was the, the orientation of the day. So my point is, we tend to uh, overestimate change in the short term, underestimate it in the long term. And part of what you can do to be successful in your careers is to have that sense, to try and see that, that future. And I'm going to come back to that uh, a little bit later as well. There's a second uh, important lesson I want to share here, one that's really misunderstood. And it's part of the seed 
of the idea of the Rake School. And when I wrote the memo or email back in 1997 that kicked off the idea, the thing that really struck me is, is that our industry, the industry of computer science and IT, really lacks people that have both the deep expertise or at least in a, a strong awareness of the technology and a strong uh, awareness or experience in business management and business leadership. Something now with these students they, they take for granted, but back then it was just very hard to find. You'd find people that were very immersed in, in the technology, maybe computer science, or knew a lot about business, but didn't know much about the other. And one of the things that I really learned from Bill Gates is the importance of seeing not only technology paradigm shifts, but business model transformations. Now let me explain that. What's a technology paradigm shift? Well, for those of you who remember the 80s, there were these things called uh, you know, PCs with character user interface. It was before the Mac. It was before Windows had really taken off. So when the world of computing went from character user interface to graphic user interface, that was a big deal. That was a technology paradigm shift. It opened up a whole new opportunity for technology value. And so for many years, we used to think, yeah, that's what you look for, the technology paradigm shift. You know, Bill identified one very early in the, the, the history of Microsoft that obviously was important. The move from a 16-bit, uh, sorry, from an 8-bit to a 16-bit operating system. That was MS-DOS. You know, the, that's how Microsoft got kicked off with the IBM PC. It was years later that I realized it's not only the technology paradigm shift that's important. The biggest opportunities, the biggest inflection points in the technology industry are when you get the technology paradigm shift combined with the business model transformation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take MS-DOS. You know, Bill Gates saw the opportunity to do an independent operating system and, and uh, uh, programming tools company, Microsoft. But nobody believed that was possible. See, back then, it was the hardware companies that did the operating system and their programming tools. But Bill believed, and in particular, he got IBM to license MS-DOS, and then he figured out he had a great business model going and getting a royalty from all of those other companies that wanted to do IBM PC-like computers. And so it wasn't only the 8 to 16-bit uh, paradigm shift, it was also that business model transformation. In the 1980s, Microsoft was way behind in the Office applications business. WordPerfect, Lotus 1, 2, 3, uh, DBase, those were Harvard Graphics. Those were the companies that dominated in applications. They were all on character user interface. We made a bet. We bet on graphic user interface. So we bet on a technology paradigm shift. But the other thing was applications were sold separately. You bought a word processor from this company. You bought a spreadsheet from this company. You bought a, um, a presentation product from this other company. Three totally different companies. And they, the list price, we think software is expensive today. The list price for these products was $495 each. So I wrote a memo. Uh, 1987 to our president, John Shirley, and I copied Bill Gates, and I said, hey, I got a great idea. Let's put three of these applications into a single box, and we'll charge one and a half times the price, or 50% less, I should say, of the combination. John said, whoa. Bill liked the idea, and that became Microsoft Office. It was not only the paradigm shift of character to user interface to graphic user interface, it was the business model transformation. So that's another important lesson that I hope you take away from, from this opportunity here. Uh, Dale Jensen, one of our, our corporate advisory board members, emphasizes the importance of mobile devices. He's absolutely right. But I would also add, and I think he would agree, look at where that, the existence of that device will transform business models, because those are where your biggest opportunities are going to be. Let me move on to another uh, lesson. Uh, does any, are there any of the uh, older folks like me in the audience that recognize what this is? Okay, well, there's actually quite a few. Uh, not older folks, but quite a few people who recognize. Uh, this is a Wang word processor. 
Now, most people here will say, well, what's a, well, I won't go, what's a Wang? Uh, <laughs> Wang was a great computer company. I mean, they were a leading computer company in the 1970s and 1980s. They had this amazing device. It's a dedicated word processor. A dedicated word processor. What does that mean? It meant that there was these people who would do word processing. We had this really nice, when I joined Microsoft in 1981, we were just kind of get going uh, in this area, and there was this really nice lady named Linda McCarty. And we would write out our documents longhand, and then we'd give them to Linda. Linda sat in this back room where she was an expert at using this dedicated word processor. And you know, a few hours later, she'd magically come back and, and hand us our document. That was word processing state of the art 1981. If I had told you in 1981 that within 25 years there'll be more than 500 million people doing word processing, the response would have been, whoa, where are you going to get all those back rooms? <laughs> and isn't that going to be really expensive? And who's going to train all those people? Well, that isn't what happened. What happened was we were part of an industry that opened up access to this technology solution to everybody. You didn't have to be a specialist. This device, in real dollars, cost $96,000 in today's, in today's dollars. And of course now, I mean, you can do a little bit of word processing on your mobile phone, certainly on your, your, your PC. So, so you can kind of see what happened. And it also teaches me another lesson that I won't go into in detail, but I will tell you it's always better to cannibalize yourself than let somebody else cannibalize you. And that was one of the problems with a lot of these, these technology companies. Let me move on to a, uh, well, let me just say one other thing. Sometimes I use the term democratization. What we did was we democratized the access to these capabilities. And so the key point I want to make there is that opens up, when you can do that, it opens up incredible value to society, which of course gives you the opportunity to have a very successful business and business model. I want to move on. This is a fairly complex chart. I'm not going to take you through the chart. It's more illustrative of another lesson that I was fortunate to learn. When Steve Ballmer in, uh, met with me in May of 19, or sorry, May of 2000, I was, I was the head of worldwide sales marketing services. He says, Jeff, I need you to, to come back to our product and business groups. And I said, Steve, I love my job leading worldwide sales. And he said, Jeff, but I need you. And I, I don't know how many of you know Balmer, but he can kind of be a little effusive. Uh, and I said, Steve, why? And he says, Jeff, it's all about growth, growth, growth. And so, OK, back to career management. I have a job I could enjoy and important to the company. Here's what he really meant. In the year 2000, most people in our industry thought office was done. They thought you know, we were headed toward low single digit, if not shrinking, revenues, and that there just wasn't that much more to do. I mean, after all, how many more features does somebody want in a word processor? They're not using all the features they have today. That was the view. But Bill Gates and I had a very different view. We had the view that there was a lot of opportunity in information work. And so I remembered a conversation that I had with Jack Welch. Uh, it was part of our CEO summit and involved a number of people. And, and Jack was sharing stories of his leadership of GE. He, at the time, he was the, the CEO of General Electric Corporation and, and to this day is viewed as one of the great business leaders uh, in the world. And, Jack was explaining that in the second phase of his leadership of GE, he ran into a situation where the younger manager said, hey, you know, Jack, you're always preaching be number one or number two, but when we get to number one, what's next? Jack said, hmm, oh, good point. And he turned around and said, what do they think is next? And, and they came together with an idea that when you're in a situation of high market share or a strong market position, what you need to do is you need to redefine your overall market space to be a bigger one. Your current position will be a smaller percentage, but that gives you more room for growth. 
So let me make it very explicit in this case. Was Microsoft in the business of creating and selling spreadsheets and word processors? If so, and if that was Microsoft Office, the industry pundits were probably right. There probably wasn't that much more growth opportunity. Or was Microsoft in the business of using the magic of software to improve the productivity of information work? If so, that's a very, very big market where we had a very small position. And that's what this chart is about. This is what we consider to be our addressable market space in the year 2000. In other words, just focusing in on how we thought about information work at that point in time. But we kept redefining our overall market space to be a bigger one. So this isn't our actual revenue. This is just the overall market that we had access to by the products that we were creating. So where here we might have had 30 or 40 percent share of this narrowly defined market, here we had something on the order of 15 or 20 percent of a much bigger market. But our business now had more than doubled in less than 10 years and was growing at more like 15 percent growth rate. So that was a very, very important lesson that I learned from Jack Welch that helped our business uh, dr dramatically. Let me, um, let me move on to two last points about business. And it really has to do with innovation. I think the, 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 I get the most opportunity to interact with the Rake School uh, students. And I think there's a lot of innovative talent in the school. But I'll tell you that a lot of times I think people misunderstand innovation. They say, oh, you know, innovation, that's where you sit in that dark room and sort of the light bulb goes off and you have the, br the bright idea. Innovation really, for, I think, maybe it works in some cases, but for the most part I don't think that's actually where greatest, the, the biggest amount of innovation comes from. I think the biggest amount of innovation comes from somebody transforming something that they see in one part of life into a new part of life. They make that transformation and that opens up new value or new ideas. Let me give you one of my favorite examples. It has nothing to do with the, the computer industry. It's about a guy who was a hiker and a hunter in uh, uh, Austria in the 1940s. And he went hunting with his dog, and he came back, and he noticed all these burrs that were stuck in his socks and on his clothes, and the burrs were in the fur of, of his dog. And he was a very curious guy, so he took the, those burrs, and he put them under a microscope, and he really studied them. What was it about that organic design that it evolved over years and years and years, probably uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of years. What was it about that design that allowed that to happen? So he studied that, and then he invented something. Anybody here know what he invented? Velcro. Velcro. George de Mestrel, 1941. Transforming something from one part of the world into another often is a great opportunity for innovation. Another of my favorite Examples of innovation I will call envisioning. I don't think it's probably quite as big as the transformation, but it's very important. 1985, we were getting ready to release the first version of Microsoft Excel. It was going out on the Macintosh. We had this programmer named Steve Hazelrig. Steve wasn't a lazy guy. He was a good programmer, but the printer was all the way down the hall, and Steve was tired of walking down the hall to check his printing code. So what did he do? He wrote a little software routine that put an image of the, the spreadsheet up on the page so that he could check and make sure that it was going to print correctly. Put a little magnifying glass on it so that he could examine all the, pis, uh, the uh, pixels. The software designer, what we call a program manager, Jay Blumenthal, came by and Jabe said, wow, that would be a great feature. That's how print pre preview ended up in Microsoft Office applications. No customer, no customer ever asked us for print preview. But Jabe was so immersed in understanding how people use spreadsheets, and he was so aware of what the technology could do,
that he put those together and he was able to envision something that would be valuable to the customer that the customer wouldn't even know to ask for. And that is one of the most important things that you can do, especially given the basis of the program. By really understanding what customers do and understanding the technology, you can do things that will delight them that they won't even know to ask about. And that's a, a second important lesson on innovation. A third important lesson on innovation has to do with business model transformation. But I've already talked about that a little bit. I'll just say one more thing. You know, Microsoft oftentimes is criticized for not being all that innovative. But actually, not only do I think we have some terrifically innovative technologies, people lose sight of the fact that a great part of our success was that we innovated in business models. And that's a very, very important thing for you to consider, especially those in the, in the, in the Rake School. Okay, I want to go to the third piece now, which is about uh, how leadership shapes culture. I want to just quickly reflect back to the values that I feel I learned from my family and my friends and my community when I was growing up. And one of the ones that I mentioned was the importance of a sense of community. But I want you to think now about the workplace. When you're in a work environment, you want that same sense of, uh, of support that you get in a community. You want to know that your neighbor will help you when you are in need. And you should help your neighbor when he or she is in need. That's what creates a great work environment. So my point is that when you're thinking about your values, think about how the values shape your leadership and your leadership will shape the culture. You want that sense of community. You want to work with people who have the right work ethic, who are passionate about what they do, who want to be their best. That's part of the reason why you chose to come here. So that is the first important point I want to mention about leadership. Your values shape your leadership, which, shape, uh, which shapes the culture of the organization. The next thing I want to do is I want to dispel what I consider to be a common myth, that people think leadership is all about personality and charisma. And I will certainly say that personality and charisma can help influence others, but it really isn't the only thing or even the key thing. There actually can be a process for leadership. This is one of these topics that I was thinking about when I said we could spend an hour or two on each of them. This is a process for leadership that I used when I was running worldwide sales, marketing, and services. But it's actually one that I think is applicable much more broadly. Each year, we had to really make sure that we were creating a vision for our organization. Then we had to make sure that we were assembling the right team and the right structure. And that's one of those things that's extremely important. If you can have a great player, but if they're not really on your team, if they're not really behind your vision, then it's better that they get off the bus. You want to get the people who are going to get behind your vision and make sure you put them in a structure where they can do their best work. You have to articulate clear goals and resources. You can't lead if you don't back it up with making sure that people have what they need to succeed. Very, very important point. And then you've got to get out there and execute. And you've got to be with your team when they're executing. Because that's an opportunity for you to learn, for you to coach, and for you to inspire them to be their best. And of course, as part of the learning, you cycle back into the next year and that helps you to create the vision or the themes or the objectives for the next year and then you go through the process of getting the team aligned around that, so on and so forth. So I actually believe there really is a process of leadership, not only some of the, the, the uh, elements that, that people typically think about. And next what I want to do is I want to share some of the I, things I learned from great leaders. Now, I, working with people like uh, Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, obviously I learned a lot from them as, as leaders. This person you wouldn't know as well, but he was probably equally influential in my life. A gentleman by the name of John Shirley, he was president of Microsoft from 1983 to 1990. And the anecdote I want to share with you about John is after he first started at Microsoft, August of 1983. We were very screwed up in manufacturing. 
And at the time, software business was largely a packaged product business. So if you couldn't manufacture the products, you weren't getting the revenue. So John said, this is an issue. He called a meeting. I, I was leading product marketing. He had the head of manufacturing. He had the head of sales. A few other people. John, very quiet, polite guy, smoked a pipe at the time. Said, Jeff, what about this? Mark, what about this? What about this? For an hour, what about this? What about this? What about this? Very precise questioning, really drilling in, trying to understand what was going on. But then, at the end of that hour, he leaned forward and he said, now this is what we're going to do. Now what he actually described was the build order system that we used at, manufact uh, in, at Microsoft for many years. And it was a way in which sales and, market, uh, sales and product marketing and manufacturing worked work, work together. But that wasn't the most important lesson I learned in that meeting. I learned that great leadership involves a willingness to roll up your sleeves and make a difference for the organization. Now John coached and supported his people. He didn't micromanage them. But when there was something that was needed, he stepped forward and, and he was willing to work with the team to make it happen. And that's why Bill Gates put so much trust into John Shirley. And to this day, I describe the assessment of, of leaders and executives as the John Shirley test. You know, are they capable of knowing what the group objectives are, but also have that deep sense of their leadership commitments? where they know they're stepping up to add value to the organization, create a new asset, solve a problem. And so that's some of the most important things I learned from, from, from John. The ability to roll up the sleeves, manage people, and drive important work when that's what was called on by the leaders. And that's why I described the difference between the objectives of the business and the leadership commitment. I mentioned I learned a few things from Bill. And this one goes back to, to 1984. Uh, we had a real problem. We had just introduced a version of MultiPlan for the Apple Macintosh. And about a month after we introduced it, we discovered that we had a serious bug. How serious? Well, some of our customers would just lose their data in the spreadsheet. So it seemed kind of bad. And we figured it out. We, figured out where it was and what we needed to do. And, and Jeff Harbour's the head of development and I was the head of marketing. Jeff and I thought we ought to recall the product. So we went to Bill and of course, Jeff and I are wondering, are we still gonna have a job after this meeting? I mean, it's not really clear. And so Bill's kind of sitting there on the couch and he's known to rock a little bit. Bill's listening and so I'm describing the fact that we found this bug and it's really bad and, and he's listening, he doesn't say a lot. And then Jeff Harbors describes what we think went wrong in the testing process and what we'd do differently in the future. And Bill listens, he doesn't say a lot. And then I describe the fact that I think we really need to recall the product and that's gonna cost us several hundred thousand dollars, let alone the impact to our reputation and Bill kinda listens and doesn't say much and then we didn't have anything else to say so like is this when the axe falls <laughs> bill looks up and he says well you came into work today you lost a few hundred thousand dollars you come into work tomorrow and you hope you do better that was a very powerful teaching moment because i knew i had a leader that recognized that we were doing things that hadn't been done before, that we were gonna make mistakes, and that what he really cared about was that we would learn from our mistakes and keep making us better. And when you work for a leader like that, it engenders a lot of loyalty. It engenders a real sense that I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna make that guy proud. <laughs> that was Bill Gates. Okay, switching gears on managers. This is a guy named Lou Pinella. Why would I have Lou Pinella up here? You know, that guy's a baseball guy. Uh, and, but for a while, and I think really our best years, he was the manager of the Seattle Mariners. And I was very fortunate to spend some time with Lou uh, over the years. And in particular, there was one night at spring training where Lou and I went out to dinner one-on-one. -on -one. And 
I'd ask Lou these questions. I'd say, Lou, what makes a great, uh, what makes a major league pitcher versus a minor league pitcher? And Lou would think for a second or two, and, and then he'd say, three things. Locate your fastball, avoid walks, great lateral movement on your breaking pitch. And I'd say, Lou, how do you do the lineup? And he'd say, think for a moment, and he'd say, well, you want to have great on-base percentage in the leadoff slot, you want to have good on-base percentage with the ability to go left or right in the second slot, third slot, you want power and average, fourth slot, you want power, so on and so forth. The whole night was me asking questions like this, Lou, what about this? And Lou would say three things, what about this? Hmm, four things, what about this? Two things. One of the things that I've learned over the years and I reflected upon from that conversation is that in business, when I've experienced great leaders, they have this ability to take the complexity of the world around them and reduce it to its essence. They have this innate ability to not ignore the complexity, but to parse it, simplify it, and really figure out what's important. And so while Lou Pinella is viewed as a very irrational type of person when he's throwing the base out into left field, <laughs> kicking dirt on the umpire's shoes, I will bet you most of the time Lou is thinking through what impact he's going to have. At the end of this conversation, I said, Lou, what makes a great baseball manager? In other words, the coach on the field. He said, you know, we had this guy named Dick Williams. He had won two World Series, but then he came to Seattle. We fired him. Lou, what makes a great baseball manager? He looked at me and he said, Jeff, five things. That number one, in today's baseball, you have to get along with people. The manager oftentimes may make as little as a tenth of what the most uh, uh, highly paid player will make. You're not going to rule, you're not going to lead by being an autocrat. He said, Jeff, number two is you have to know what you can do to get people to perform near their peak day in and day out. When Edgar Martinez is on a roll, what is it that I do or don't do that's going to help him keep there? And when he's headed into a slump, what is it that I say or don't say that will help him avoid going into that slump. How do I help people be successful day in and day out? Number three, PR. Kind of looked at him a little funny, you know, public relations. He said, Jeff, come on, the players read what I say. If they read in the paper the right thing, it'll send them in the right direction. If they read the wrong thing, it sends them in the wrong direction. Number four, game strategy. He said, Lou, come on, the average fan is going to think that's the most important thing you do. You decide the lineup. You decide when you're pitching. This is when Lou gets a little animated at the dinner. He says, look, Jeff, I don't hit for those guys. I don't pitch for those guys. I don't field for those guys. They're on the field. I expect them to perform. Even in that statement, there's an important leadership concept, that sense of accountability and holding people accountable, but also, as Woody Woodward, the GM, told me later, Lou was really good at getting people to be in the situation where they had the greatest chance of, of success given their talent. But game strategy was fourth. And number five? Number five was getting along with the front office. They're the people who make the player trades and give you the talent. Now, I thought, wow, that's very interesting. About six months later, I was running the sales organization and I was thinking about that conversation. I realized, what makes a great sales manager? They probably need to get along with people. They probably need to be able to help their people perform near their peak day in and day out. They probably need to be a good spokesperson, both internally and externally, for the organization. They probably ought to be good on sales strategy and be able to coach their folks to do their best on sales strategy. And they probably need to be able to get along with the customer service department, the, the engineering department, the marketing <coughs> department. So what Lou Pinella taught me that night wasn't just what it means to be a great manager on the field. Lou Pinella taught me about what it means to be a great leader. And that's one of the things that I really, really admired uh, about him. And I recognize that's why he's success, so successful. Well, for me, I've had the opportunity to, to work with uh, a number of amazing people, but also to live in a very unique time. And I think there are periods in history where there's an incredible shift in society, like the Renaissance or the Industrial Revolution. And I think we live in the Information Revolution. I think 
50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to look back and say that this was a 30, 40, or 50 year period of time where we transformed society for the next 200 years. And so for me, gosh, what a lucky kid from Nebraska, farm kid from Nebraska. I'm born at this time, I live at this time, I get the opportunity to, to work in this industry, and even more amazing, I get the opportunity to have these incredible uh, experiences as a, as a part of it. So this was really my, my dream job. This was a dream job for me, the ability to participate in this global information-based economy. But as I mentioned last night at the, the celebration of computer science here, the thing that I was really fortunate to, to have happen is to be exposed to so many great people who were changing the world. They were passionate about that. And when I'm here and when I talk to the students and the faculty, I feel that passion here. And so I really look forward to what these leaders will do as they take their leadership roles for our state, for our country, and our world. Thank you very much. Can we do some, are we okay to do some Q&A? Yep. Okay, great. How do you want to do it? I think in order to make it quick, if you can come to the microphone, that's great. If you're a long way from the microphone, hold up your hand, ask the question, and I'll repeat it. Yes, please. Well, I think I, first, part of it is you have to find the right organization with the right culture. Uh, sorry, to repeat the question, the question has to do with, with um, uh, really long you know, projections about what's going to happen, which I do believe are important, and how do you get businesses to, to, to think about that and pay attention. And the, the point I would make to you is that um, you have to find the right culture. And Microsoft research may not be 20 years, but it's at least 10 years. And, and that's because that's a big part of our culture at, at Microsoft. And I think sometimes if it's like 20 or 30 years, you're, you're probably going to need to go even to a different type of organization, which is more like a think tank or something like that. But my number one piece of advice is to figure out what are, what are the types of organizations that are going to have the culture uh, and view that as a cultural value to think in, in, in that way. And that's the place where I'd start. What you're going to end up doing is you're going to find people like you who are passionate about those kinds of things. Thanks for your question. Anybody else have a question? Uh, we got, are you looking for the microphone here? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Rake school students, you got a priority, okay. <laughs> I was just wondering what kind of priority you place on having a competitive advantage over um, others in the market space versus uh, having an open standard that creates sort of an ecosystem. I guess with like Microsoft Office, there's a balance there between having an open e ecosystem that other developers can add on to, but also there's some more sort of proprietary parts to it that give you a competitive advantage. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I think you hit on the answer in your, how you asked the question. It's all about striking the right balance. See, one of the things, you know, having the opportunity to, to create intellectual property that you can sell is part of what draws the investment to, to do new things. And so you do want to have an environment that helps to encourage that. On the other hand, one of the ways in which you can get what you've created out there more broadly is to create a sense of openness, a, a, an open ecosystem where people can plug in and, and add value. Uh, and that's, that's very important, too. I mean, I, I would draw the example with Open Office. I mean, Open Office is an is a open source project. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's a lot of people doing very good work, but mostly what they're doing today 
is about cloning where Microsoft Office was years ago. For those customers who are okay with that type of value, that's fine for them. For customers who recognize that the world of information work is continuously changing and they want to bet on somebody who's going to keep their Office tools up to date, then Microsoft Office is a better choice. I actually think it's very good that there are competitive approaches in the marketplace. I, I think the so-called open source uh, model is a good one. I think the commercial software model is a good one. I think there's a balance in terms of how you think about what's quote unquote proprietary versus what's uh, open to the, to the ecosystem. And striking that balance is actually the way to maximize value for society. Thanks for your question. Uh, in the back, please. A question. Thanks. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, you've talked a lot about your career development and how that happened. And I know your latest job is running the Gates Foundation. How do you think that this idea of, you know, working outside of the field, is that, is that something that comes from the... That's a great question, especially because I kind of um, cut short there? talking about uh, the Gates Foundation and my new role. So now let me say a little bit about that. Because uh, I think a big part of your question was, why am I making the switch? What do I think is applicable? So on and so forth. As I said, I had a dream job, but I think part of understanding your dream job is also being willing to recognize when it's going to be time for, for you as an individual and for the company to have new leaders step up. And in my view, although the people I worked for disagreed a little bit, I thought now was the, the right time for me. I didn't know what I was going to do when I decided to retire. I thought I might teach business school. You can kind of see why. I enjoy the opportunity to interact with the, the students. I thought I might get more deeply involved in philanthropy, the Rakes Foundation. I thought I might uh, do some agribusiness stuff with my brother. Uh, and with the foundation and to the heart of your question, what I learned when I knew the job was open, I learned that while I don't have a deep experience in the domain, uh, the content domain of each of the foundation areas, what I do have is a set of experiences that can help Bill and Melinda define and refine the strategies to deliver on the value of the foundation, which the number one value of the foundation is that all lives have equal value. Yet as we look around the world, we see incredible inequities. So Bill and Melinda are dedicated to creating the strategies that are going to take on those challenges. And they felt that I could help them as the CEO in that role. And in addition, given my experiences in leading teams, that I could help connect their vision and their strategy with those leadership teams to deliver uh, on that. And it really leads to perhaps my ultimate responsibility is to create a great environment for people to do their best work. So for me, uh, the, the Gates Foundation is in a, 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 just it's my next dream job. I mean, I just feel spoiled. You know, most people in life don't get their dream job. I'm getting two. I get the opportunity to take what I learned and imply, in applying technology to, uh, go back here, technology to helping people around the world with science and technology and systems thinking and building the kind of organization that is more and more focused in on maximizing the impact that they can have on on behalf of, of, of people. And so for me, this is you know, another, another dream job. And, and I think the thing that I have to do is be very balanced in understanding what I do know and what I don't know. You know, another way to think about it is that 30 years ago, I wanted to try and figure out how to, to change the, the world on a positive way through agricultural policy. Well, I just took a 28-year a detour. And, and now with the Gates Foundation, we're working on agricultural development as one of the most important things to help address these inequities in the world. So that's how I think about this transition for me. Thanks for your question. Maybe one last question and then we'll, I'll wrap up. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned some uh, methodologies that you had of what good leaders possess in just terms of how they interact with other people. But how do you instill in the people that you are leading um, to follow in your footsteps in doing those same behaviors? Well, um, a, a big, there's, there, that's a rich topic. There are two key things, though, uh, sort of the Lou Pinella thing, <laughs> two key things. One is you yourself have to be a role model 
for the values in the organization and the kind of work environment that you want. So that's the first thing you need to really reflect on. You also need to be a great coach of the people in the organization to develop their sense of understanding and execution on the values and help them be better when they need to be better. One of the things that Microsoft said about leaders, which I really like, is that leaders are really about making uh, people who make others great. And that's a, a very important way to think about leadership. So, so the, the process, if you will, is to be a great role model and to be a great coach in making others great when you're the leader. I'm going to wrap up here. It'll take two minutes uh, in case people are worried about timing. I want to share a little bit about what I've learned for people to be successful in their jobs, especially the kind of people I get a chance to experience here. You know, it's like at Microsoft. Uh, and also, I've now found at the Gates Foundation. You know, at Microsoft, here at the Rake School, you, you tend to have a lot of uh, overambitious, overachiever type A folks. And then they come into an environment like Microsoft, or as I'm seeing in the foundation, and they can kind of be a little bit overwhelmed. There's a lot of other people who are just like them. And I hear the term, I'm drinking from the fire hose, or I'm breathless. You know, people feel like they're just running as fast as they can. And the thing that I've learned over the years, especially given this type of personality, is that you have to teach yourself you can't do it all. In fact, the most important phrase, and I want you to remember this, uh, is that you've got to use your good judgment to set the right priorities, and make the right trade-offs. You know, in business, there's a dozen things you can do when you're in a high-growth environment. But what you really need to do is you need to pick those things that are going to add the most value to the organization and be willing to trade off those things that would add value but just not as great as the things that you'll focus in on and do well. And that's very, very hard for this personality type. So use your good judgment to set the right priorities and make the right trade-offs. Then over the years, I discovered that some of the, these folks end up kind of, uh, oh, maybe uh, getting burned out. You know, they, they, they don't have the right work-life balance. I remember an employee or conversation with an employee named Phil. Phil was very intense. And he comes to me one day and he says, you know, Jeff, I don't have the right work-life balance. And I said, Phil, what are you going to do? Jeff says, all right. Uh, Phil says, well, I'm going to work less. And I said, Phil, I don't think it'll work. Now, it wasn't because I was telling him he needed to work as much or more. What I was really telling him was, Phil, what are you going to do? Sit home and watch TV? I don't think so. So the message that I tried to impart to Phil and I tried to impart to all of you is that in order to achieve the right balance in your life, what you've got to do is to set the right priorities outside of work, your right personal priorities. Use your good judgment and make the right trade-offs. Now, I always give the Microsoft folks, I always gave them a sense of what I thought those might be. Number one should be their family. You know, many of them were young parents and said, look, go home, have dinner with the family. You know, be there on the first day when your kids go to school. That's important. You know, instead of spending an extra hour doing the email, go home and, and, and have dinner with the family or go to the church meeting or go to the school meeting, whatever it is. That should be the number one priority. Number two priority for them, I would say community service. I always like to point out to Microsoft employees, as a company, we would not be nearly as successful if we didn't have the institutions in our community to support our families, our friends, and our neighbors. Educational institutions, medical institutions, other types of support uh, structures in the community. So we have a vested interest in having healthy community infrastructure. And that's one of the reasons why Trisha and I put so much into United Way, because we believe that they are best positioned to understand what needs to get done in the community. And then I'd say, number three, pick something fun. For me, it's Cornhusker football. I'm going to watch every Bo Pelini show off satellite. I'm going to go to at least three or four football games this year. Uh, you know, some of them wanted Texas. I mean, give me a break. Uh, 
So, you know, whatever it be, you know, your golf game, your ultimate Frisbee, you know, pick some things that you really enjoy. But the thing that I'll tell you is if you set the right priorities outside of, of your work and you use your good judgment and make the right trade-offs, you probably will work fewer hours. But I think you'll be more efficient in how you use your time. I think you'll be happier in what you do, and I think you'll be healthier. And I think you're more likely to have a long, fun, happy, and healthy career if you do that. And for all of you, if you could have a career as happy and fun as my own, that's the best thing that I could wish for you. So with that, I say thanks very much. I appreciate your support of the Rake School.